All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to lecture 39 of quantum mechanics part one. In uh, the previous lectures, we have been talking about uh, the relationship between uh, the generators of symmetries and uh, finite elements of those symmetries. So I have explained to you that for rotations, for instance, we have uh, different kinds of representations that one can have. Uh, and uh, those correspond to, to uh, the symmetry properties of different kinds of objects. So if you have a three dimensional vector, it transforms under uh, the three dimensional representation of um, SO3 uh, whose, uh, whose, whose generators are given by this, by, the, by these matrices. And uh, if you have the, if you have a spin one half system, so that's a two dimensional uh, object Uh, please uh, do not unmute yourself unless you have a question. Uh, otherwise, if there are uh, interruptions, then I might have to mute everybody. Um, so then if you have a spin one half particle, it's a two dimensional particle, uh, the generators are the poly matrices. And uh, uh, if, if you are talking about uh, how does the, the wave function transform? So the wave function is an infinite dimensional vector, right? So it transforms under the, the generators are the usual angular momentum operators which you have studied in terms of uh, X and Y coordinates. Okay, any questions at this point? All right. So uh, today what I want to Mm, talk about and I guess today and tomorrow for these will probably be our last two classes starting on Monday uh, I will begin the review okay uh, course review so today I want to talk about uh, composite systems and entanglement. Okay. So, so they, these, this is actually the most uh, quantum mechanical effect that one can think of. And uh, it comes about when we try to imagine how to describe uh, a composite system. So. What do I mean by a composite system, right? So for instance, we have talked about um, uh, particles with spin, right? So we have, let's say, a single particle with spin one half, right? So what would be uh, the, the states of this system? It's a two dimensional uh, space, right? So there are two basis vectors. Let's say the up vector and the down vector, right? Alternatively, you can also write this in alpha beta. So the up vector is one zero and down vector is zero one, right? This is the simplest kind of, um, quantum state one can have, right? Uh, or, or one could consider a particle on a, on a line, right? So a particle on a line, how do we describe the state? We describe the state in terms of uh, the position eigenkets, right? So how do we write it? We write something like this, psi of x, Ket x dx, right? Minus infinity. 
and this is this is an infinite dimensional state okay now obviously uh, nature consists of more complicated systems uh, let me close the window i think there is too much audio disruption from outside give me one thing okay so now obviously nature consists of more complicated systems than just a single spin one half particle or a single particle on a line right uh, so if you consider a, a, a box of uh, containing atoms right let's say in the form of a gas or something so you have lots of these particles around right now classically you would say that okay each particle has some position and momentum right and quantum mechanically what one would say right one would say that okay that each particle has some state right let's say we'll call it psi 1 psi 2 psi n so on right so here this would be p1 x1 p2 x2 p n x n so this is this is the classical uh description this is the quantum one right but now the thing is that see for my box of atoms right i can define what is the total momentum like if i want to ask a question what is the total momentum of my gas right or the total energy of all the particles what would i say i would say that my total momentum is just the sum of all the individual momenta right no problems with this this is easy we have lots of we have a bunch of vectors we can add them all up right so this is this is this is classical but now what about uh if what if i treat these particles as quantum mechanical particles right so what is the difference in treating them as classical and quantum in the classical case these particles their wave functions will not overlap there is no such thing as interference between the particles right here uh, wave functions can do more more interesting things so the so one can ask well what is the momentum of the total momentum of this gas of quantum particles now total momentum of the quantum mechanical gas right how do we define that now let's just remind ourselves what is the momentum of a single particle and for simplicity we will work with a gas we'll work with a in 1d right so we just have a box one dimensional box this is a one dimensional box and all the particles are within this box okay so what is the momentum of a single particle the momentum of a single particle right we can define the expectation value let's say of the momentum operator right for a single particle how would i say i would say something like this psi 1 psi 1 right this is a momentum expectation value for single particle okay so now you might ask well what if i have more than one particle right 
and here I will put put a one over here because this this p right this operator p is the momentum operator acting on the state of the first part. So one can ask, well, and 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 what would be the form of this momentum operator? Right, just to remind you, this momentum operator is minus i h bar d by dx, right? Now this derivative, this this d by dx, it refers to the position coordinate, right? But the position coordinate of which which position coordinate, right? For example, if I have more than one particle, each particle has its own independent position coordinate. Right. So it has to refer to the position coordinate of the particle whose momentum I want to find out. Right. So this means that each particle has its own individual. momentum operator okay so there is a there is a momentum operator which will act on the first particle on the second particle and so on so if i want to find the momentum of the second particle what do i do well i have to take the expectation value of p2 and p2 in which state in this state the psi2 state right So this is the momentum of the second particle. Now the question is that can I can I define so in the classical case, remember that I can define a total momentum, right? Which is the sum of all the individual momenta. And why is this nice? Why is this important? It's important because such a quantity is conserved, right? So if there is no external force on the system. The total momentum is conserved, right? So the question now becomes: Can I define a total momentum for my quantum part, quantum system consisting of two particles, right? So I have two particles. The first particle has wave function psi one x one. Second particle has wave function psi two x two, right? And how would I write down the states? I would write the state like this. Okay. Now the question is, why am I writing <coughs> these states uh, in this way? Why am I putting a one over here and a two over here? Right. The reason is because these particles are independent, right? So, so if I if I write down if I don't put this index one here, then I don't know which system I'm referring to. Right, and so for instance, this particle can have a different wave function. This psi one x one does not need to be the same as the wave function of the second particle, right? so this is again the same thing that i mentioned here each particle has its own individual momentum operator and each particle has its own individual position operator and position eigen eigen state right so this is the this, this is the these are the states of the two particles taken individually so the question is how to define the total momentum right how can i define the total momentum can i define it like this let's say can i write p some operator p as operator p1 plus operator p2 right is this is this does this make sense right well let's let's see what this is going to be the minus i h bar right d by d x1 d by d x2 right this is p1 
and this is P2. Right, so the derivative with respect to x1 and the derivative with respect to x2. But now <coughs> this operator should act on some state, right? To give me some expectation value. So I should be able to write something like this. Expectation value of P is some expectation value of this operator in some state psi. where psi is the total state, right? It's a comp of the composite system. Composite meaning consisting of the two particles, right? So what can this psi be? Like how, how can I express this psi? So again, we are just trying different things, right? Is this, is this allowed? So then the next thing is that is, how should I define the total state? Can I write, for instance, something like this? Psi one plus psi two, right? Is, is this, does this make sense? Right? Can anybody tell me whether or not something like this would make sense. The answer is that it won't. And why, why is that? Well, because If you have something like this, right? So what, what does this represent? What does this kind of a sum represent? It represents a superposition, right? But when we, when we talk about a superposition, right? Remember that a superposition is between uh, states or vectors which live in the same vector space, right? So if I have two vectors, V1 plus V1 and V2, then I can define the superposition of these two vectors as long as these two vectors live in the same vector space V, right? But if V1 lives in one vector space and V2 lives in the second vector space, then this does not have any meaning, right? Right? For, in, for example, V1 could be a two-dimensional vector space and V2 could be a, a three-dimensional vector space. So how can I take the sum of a two-dimensional vector and three-dimensional vector? Right? That doesn't make any sense. So this, this kind of a sum is not possible. It doesn't make sense, the sum of psi one and psi two. And why is that? It's because psi one and psi two, they live in different vector spaces. They live in different state space, Hilbert spaces, right? So psi one lives in H1, the Hilbert space of the first particle. Psi two lives in H2, the Hilbert space of the second particle. Right, so that we cannot, we cannot define a state like this, which is a sum of these two vectors, which uh, live in different vector spaces. It, it is not allowed mathematically, right? So what do we need to do in order to define this composite system? 
right? In order to be able to define the total state of the system, what do we need? We need to ask, I am given the Hilbert space of one system, H1, and given the Hilbert space of the second system, H2. Can I make a bigger Hilbert space? And remember, Hilbert space is just a vector space, okay? Bigger Hilbert space, H, out of H1 and H2, right? So can I take these two vector spaces and can I combine them in some way? Can I join them? Right, so that I get a big, bigger space, a bigger vector space. In that bigger vector space, I should be able to define the state of the first particle and also the state of the second particle. Okay, so how can I make a bigger Hilbert space starting with two smaller Hilbert spaces? Or how can I make a, make a bigger vector space? starting with two smaller vector spaces, right? This is the main question. So we consider, uh, uh, we instead of the particle on a line, we'll consider the, the example of two spin, okay? So we'll take two, spin one half particles, okay? We'll call them A and B. So this, the first particle has uh, the vector space HA, the second particle has the vector space HP, right? So psi A, the state of the first particle would be something like this, right? Alpha times up, but now I'll put an A over here, a subscript A to denote the fact that this is the up state of the first particle. And beta down A, right? And the state of the second particle, right? Similar, the same way, some gamma up state B, delta, down state B. Kind of. So is this making sense? Can somebody please say something to tell me if you understand what I'm doing at this stage? that this is just the state of the first particle, this is the state of the second particle. Is there any difficulty with understanding this, this aspect? And can a few of you please turn your videos yes, on? Sir. Can I please have some videos turned on so that I can get some visual feedback? Thanks, Priya. Thanks, Vishnu. Okay. Now, let us perform a measurement on, on this system, okay? When you perform a measurement, we have to measure the state of both the particles, right? We have to measure the state of particle A and particle B. Now, what are the possible outcomes? The possible outcomes are, are as follows, right? Both the particles could be in the spin-up state. 
right? So when I perform a measurement, I will get either spin up or spin down, right? Or one particle can be in the spin up and the other can be in the spin down state. Or spin down and spin up. And finally both in the spin down state. These are the possible outcomes, right? How many such outcomes are there? There are four outcomes, right? Now, I don't know if I actually ever uh, used this uh, description in, in this class before, but each one of these possible outcomes, right? They are classically distinguishable from each other, right? So I can distinguish this outcome from this outcome. I know that they are different. If I cannot distinguish them, right, then it doesn't make sense to refer to them as different outcomes. So they are distinguishable, right? So I will call this outcome, I, I will give it a name, okay? Let me put this here. I will call this outcome 0, 1, 2, and 3. And these outcomes, they are all distinguishable from each other, right? They have to be. Right? Now, why have I given this, use this notation get? Because I want to say that this outcome is actually a single vector. Right? A single vector in what? Is it a single vector in H A? Is it a single vector in H B? And the answer is no, it's not a vector in either H A or H B. It's a vector in the composite space which I have found out of both H and H. So these are vectors and they are distinguishable. So if they are distinguishable, that means they are orthogonal. Right? So if you say that two, two, two vectors are, are, are different from each other, how do you say two vectors are different? Two vectors are as different from each other as possible. How do you make that statement mathematically? Right? Or you say two vectors are exactly the same. How do you make that statement mathematically? So if I have two vectors like this, and two vectors like this. Which one is, which one are distinguishable and which is indistinguishable? Okay. This one is distinguishable. No? These two are the other different alternatives. They are orthogonal to each other. They have nothing in common with each other. But these two are indistinguishable. Right? So this is perfectly distinguishable. And this is indistinguishable. Right? So how do I define distinguishability? I, I say that it is related to orthogonality. Right? Okay. So these vectors, they have to be orthogonal to each other, right? So that means if I take the inner product of one and zero, I should get zero. Two and three, I should get zero and so on, right? So <clears throat> now I have a set of four vectors, zero, one, two, three. 
right? This is an orthogonal basis, right? They are, they are a set of four vectors. They are orthogonal to each other. Each one is perpendicular to the other one, right? So they form a basis. They form a basis of what? of a four dimensional vector space, right? Well, because there are four vectors, no? And what is this four dimensional vector space? This is the total vector space, which consists of my combination of the two smaller vectors. And this is called the tensor product space. Okay. And this symbol is used to indicate the tensor product. Right? Now, what if we work in components? So if you work with components, let's say, so, uh, so first, le let me remind you what is zero. Zero is this this state, right? Up state and up state, both are in up state. So I will write it like this: up tensor up. Okay, and now I will write it in components also. So in components, what was the up state? It was one zero, right? And what was this upstate? This was also one zero. So now the question is that if I have two vectors, okay? So I have a vector V1. So I'll write, I have a vector U with components U1 to UN. And I have a vector V with components VN to VN. How do I write down this tensor product vector, right? This is called the tensor product. How do I write it down? This vector consists of how many components? And by the way, they don't have to be the same size. So this can be a different size. This can be some M dimensional. This can be N dimensional. They can be different sizes. So what are the components of this vector? U1, V1, U1, V2, till UN, V1, then U2, V1, so on, right? So you're taking each component and multiplying it by the other vector. So how many components will there be? At the end, you'll be left with UN, VM. How many components will there be here? n times m, right? n times m. So let, let us take this, this vector, these two vectors and write down the tensor product of these two vectors, okay? So let us write down the tensor product of these two vectors. Tensor with vector B, okay? One zero, tensor one zero, right? Now this will have four components, two by two. What are those components? We take one times one is one, then zero, zero and zero, right? Let me do this for all the all the states, okay? This is a little bit tedious, 
but once you understand the general idea you won't have to keep doing this all the time na then things will become much simpler and much faster what will be the components now it will be 1 times 0 0 1 times 1 right and then 0 0 So, are you seeing a pattern emerge in this picture? Right. This vector is one, then all zeros. The second vector is zero, then one, and then all zeros. Right. So, similarly, you can write down the second, the vector which we labeled as two. One zero, right? Now what this will be is zero zero, one zero, and then I have a last vector four. Uh, well, three since I start counting from zero, in which both of them are down. these are my four vectors now you can see that all four of these vectors they are orthogonal to each other right you can just look at it and you can read off the the dot product between any of these vectors it will be zero these are my basis vectors right these are my basis vectors of what these are the basis vectors of h and what is h is equal to h a tensor h b okay now if you have a, any state in this in this in this bigger space right if you have some state in this bigger space how will you write this state you will write it as a superposition of these four vectors right these are the four basis vectors so any state will be a superposition of these four vectors right so let me write a state like this okay let me write like this alpha 0 beta 1 gamma 2 delta 3 okay this alpha beta gamma delta are not the same as the alpha beta gamma delta over here okay they are not the same don't confuse it's just that i don't have a finite number of symbols so actually to make life simpler maybe i should uh, well i'll use something else i'll call it a b c and d i can also write it as a, uh, like this right a b c and d okay now the measurement outcomes that i mentioned earlier right these measurement outcomes so if i measure the state psi what will i get i will get either 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 and with probability mod, alpha modulus alpha square modulus beta square modulus c square modulus d square right so this is just my usual quantum mechanics now right but something very interesting can happen okay what is that let us look at this uh, first state 
this corresponds to what i'll write it in short shorthand notation like this up up b i'll write as up down c i'll write as down up okay and i think it's clear what this means right and d i'll write as down down okay now let's consider a special a particular state let's consider a particular state 1 by root 2 root 2 is normalization okay so or in the vector notation it will be 1 by root 2 0 0 one by 2 okay so this is my this is a state now this is a valid state of the system now it's just a linear combination of my basic state nothing wrong with this perfectly fine now i perform a measurement on this state okay right so what do i measure i measure the two spins right i have two two spins a and b i measure the first spin and the second spin okay measure spins a and b right now there are two possibilities either i get up up or down down right but first let me just measure spin a alone okay i'm not going to measure spin b i'm going to look at spin a only fine so i have some apparatus which can probe bo both the spins individually if i measure spin a alone right i can get two possibilities i can get either the up or the down right okay now let's say i get the up when i measure spin a right if i get the up when i measure spin a what does this tell me about spin b does this tell me something about spin b look at this state right if i am getting up state in spin a that means that i am getting this component because this component doesn't have spin a in the up state right because remember this is the state of the whole system so if i measure the state of the first spin to be in the up state this tells me that spin b must be it has to be in the up state sorry it has to be in the up state now you see i have not measured spin b right i have not performed a measurement of spin b even without performing a measurement i know that what will be the outcome of my measurement of the second spin and if spin a turns out to be the down state then this tells me that spin b must be also in the down state right now for a minute just imagine that instead of quantum mechanical systems you are talking about classical system you are talking about classical spin okay 
right? So if I have a if I have a collection of some classical systems, and I measure one property of the of 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 one system. Does that place any restriction on the property of the second system which I will measure? No, right? I mean, they are independent. If I find the first ball to be red, the second ball can be either blue, green, or red. It doesn't matter. But in the quantum mechanical case, what is happening? I have two balls. They can be in two different colors. Let's say red and green, or red and blue, right? And now I write down the state of the system like this. Red, blue, plus blue red. i measure the the state of the first ball if i find that the state of the of the first ball is red if i find that the first ball is is red the second ball has to be what it has to be blue and if the first ball is blue the second ball has to be red right Now here's the crazy part. These two balls don't have to be in the same place. I can send one ball over here to one end of the planet and the other ball to the other end of the planet. And I can have two, two different sets of laboratories, right? One in Mangalore and one in, uh, what's the opposite of Mangalore? Toronto. And so these people, the people in Mangalore and Toronto, they cannot communicate with each other, right? So they can't cheat. Okay. So they both make a measurement. What are the possible outcomes? Red and blue, blue and red. Can they ever get blue and blue? Can they ever get red and red? Right. No. So now imagine that only the person in Mangalore makes a measurement and finds that this first ball is in the red state. Fine. So we have sent one ball to Mangalore. This ball we have sent to Mangalore. And the second ball we have sent to Toronto. The person in Mangalore makes a measurement and says, finds that the state of the ball is red. Now, this person cannot communicate with the person in Toronto, but the Mangalore person knows what the measurement outcome of the ball in Toronto is going to be. But sir, uh, this is possible only when uh, they are measuring simultaneously, right? It doesn't matter. And and it, it, if they measure simultaneously, that makes the situation even more interesting because simultaneously means that you cannot communicate. But there is no, uh, in terms of relativity, there is no, uh, what do you call it, time-like path connecting the two two locations. So you cannot even send any information from one, one instant to the other. From On the plane of simultaneity, you cannot communicate between any two points. Right? So there is no communication between, between these two. But even though there is no communication, and even though the distances between these two systems are very large, they are, they are correlated with each other, right? Their outcomes are correlated. 
So we say that such systems are entangled. Right? Entanglement, right? What is entanglement? Like if you think about it uh, in a non-physical sense, entanglement is like when you have a bunch of threads, right? Or wires, bunch of this thing, power wires. And they all get like all mixed up and bound up like this, right? I call this entangled. Why do I, wh what does that mean? What is a tangle? Tangle means that it's, I can't separate them. I cannot tell which one is which one. In this case, well, it's not. But if you let them be for some days and nobody worries about them, you come to the bunch of wires, you can't tell which one is which one. They're all tangled up. Right? So such systems are referred to as entangled. So this is an entangled state. Okay. Uh, now, do you guys have a class at three? Okay. So let me give you no, another sir. example. Okay. I'll give you another example. This time I'll talk about a, this particle in a, on a line. Okay. So I have a, I have a particle on a line. It consists of, right, these, these. How would I write down the, the state of this system? I would write it like this, psi of A, X, A, get X, A, D, X, A, okay? This is the first particle. Psi of B is equal to, okay, this is the second particle. Now what I'll assume is that the first particle the, the wave function of the first particle is localized around some position. Okay. And the state of the second particle is localized around some other position. Fine. So I'll say this psi A, this guy, right? It's like some delta function. Okay. It's like delta x a minus x a naught. So this position is x a naught and this position is x b naught. And psi b is like delta x b minus x b naught. Okay. Now I want to write down the state of the full system, right? And this state has to be, it will be an element of this Hilbert's, the tensor product space, right? Now, what will the tensor product space, what will be the elements of the tensor product space? First, let's just look at that. It will be something like this. Let me just write it down and then you will understand Okay. So excuse me, sir. Yeah. So if you made a two particle system in a, a composite state uh, in a small mm -hmm. volume, mm -hmm. and you said we can uh, make those two particles far apart. No, no, no. So here I'm not, here, well, I mean, I'm not saying that they are far apart or they're close together and thing. I'm just saying that there are two particles on a line. I, at this point, I'm not placing any restrictions on, on how far apart or how close together they can be. Okay, I'm just saying that there, there are two particles on a line. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, as you know that I'm recovering from this cold and <laughs> I have to wear some socks <laughs> in Mangalore. Can you believe that? 
Okay, so this is this is the state of the composite system. Now, if you look at this state, it looks the same as this kind of a state, right? It's a sum over up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down, right? It's a sum over all the possibilities. And so this state is also a sum over all the possibilities. But now there are an infinite number of possibilities now, so I have to do an integration instead of a sum. Okay. Now let me just write down uh, a simple version of this state. Uh, and so as an example, let me say uh, the following, right? That there are two positions, okay? Actually, x a naught and x b naught is fine. Let me call this position x1 and let me call this position x2. Okay, so let me write down a state which looks like this. X1, X2, plus X2, X1, 1 by root. Okay, what, what does this, what does this, this represent, right? This represents the first particle is at this location x1 and the second particle is at the location x2, right? I have two locations. Here I have the first particle and here I have the second particle, right? What does this represent? This represents that the second particle is at x1 and the first particle is at xa as is at x2 right so a and b refers to the particle and x1 and x2 refers to the position so x1 and x2 don't change but a and b they switch right this is also an entangled state Okay. Why is it an entangled state? Because if I perform a measurement of the position of the first particle, I immediately get information about the position of the second particle. If I find that the first particle is at X1, that means the second particle has to be at X2. And now, Coming to your question, Vishnu, these two locations could be very far apart from each other. No, so I was asking about exactly that. Uh, you talked about the situation where uh, we can make them in Bangalore and foreign. Mm -hmm. So will there be any uh, no effect on the of the state if we made them far apart? Right, so, so there's a difference between uh, this kind of a wave function. Maybe some errors or something. No, no. Oh, uh, that way. Um, no, there can be. There can be, but it's, it's possible to do such experiments. People do them on a daily basis. In fact, now we are building a quantum internet, uh, which relies on this, on the ability to trans transport entangled pairs far apart from each other. And it's happening on a daily basis now. So the, so the possibility of errors and all are there, but uh, you know, technologically those can be overcome. Okay. So this is an entangled state of two particles. Okay, I'll stop here for today. And tomorrow, I will talk about operators acting on composite systems, right? So you remember that if you go back a little bit, uh, the question was, how do we define a momentum? How do we define this momentum for a composite system? No? 
so tomorrow i will show you that when we have a state like this when we have a tensor product like this we can define a momentum operator which acts on the whole system which gives me the total momentum okay uh stop here for now and see if you have any questions uh sir mm -hmm. uh sir if we try to understand uh, this angle entanglement situation in classical mechanics uh mm -hmm. how it is different from quantum mechanics i mean what will so, be the result in classical mechanics so in classical mechanics you don't have such correlations between uh, between the different parts of a system no like i mean you can um um you can't i mean you can't construct any such example in classical mechanics uh like for instance uh i i make a cake it is in two flavors strawberry and vanilla okay now let's say it's a quantum cake so it can be in a superposition of those two flavors right it can be in strawberry and vanilla some superposition fine kosho my you listening yes sir right now let's take two of these cakes fine okay and i make a make a state of these two cakes i make a state of these two cakes so that it which looks like this meaning the first cake is in the strawberry flavor and the second cake is in the vanilla flavor and the other option is that the first cake is in the vanilla flavor the second cake is in the strawberry flavor now can you do something like this with a classical cake kusum can you can you do something like this with a classical classical system uh sir but in this uh, ball example this mangalore and toronto example yeah uh, common yeah. like uh, if we do this experiment uh, in different in um, classical mechanics way uh, it looks it looks like common like uh, red then we get blue if we get blue then we get red ah uh, i see what you're saying that uh, that you to begin with you have two balls right yes and one ball is red and one ball is blue right yes and then you don't look at the two balls you transport one ball to mangalore and the other ball to toronto and then if one person looks at the ball in mangalore they say it's a red ball right yeah and the person in toronto then that means the person in toronto has to have a blue ball right fine yes but the difference between the classical case and the quantum mechanical case is that in the classical case i know that my system which ball is red and which ball is blue but in the quantum mechanical case i don't know which one is red and which one is blue right so it if means you look at this the, it means you, after look, the measurement it can... after only after the measurement right only after the measurement when the ball collapses into one state either the red state or the blue state that is when i know that the other ball is going to collapse into the different state do you do you understand the difference between the classical situation and the quantum situation in the classical situation i can only have this or this 
I cannot have a superposition of these two. No? Yes, yes, sir. Right. And uh, and there is a uh, very well defined way of uh, in which one can uh, uh, do this. Uh, known as there, there are certain inequalities that one can write for any classical system or any quantum system, and it turns out. Uh, that you can show that any classical system would satisfy those inequalities, and any any quantum system will. Uh, so, if if those inequalities are not satisfied, that means your system is not classical. Okay, and and those are known as Bell's Bell's inequality, named after physicist, great physicist named John Bell. so there there is a there is a very well defined sense in which one can say that okay a system is classical or not classical and such states such states they violate those inequalities so if you don't know anything about quantum mechanics or you don't know anything about states you just look at what is possible by what are what you can measure right and then you say that okay something has certain it has this property of being classical right so then that means that the types of correlations that you can have between possible outcomes in two different locations right so those correlations uh have to satisfy certain these in sets of inequality so i uh, uh, an example of this i mean is something that we have looked at before right is that remember that for quantum states quantum states satisfy this inequality na no? the heisenberg bound right so if you if you have something which which violates this inequality then that tells you that this is not a quantum state this will be something which is classical right Do you understand? Y yes, sir. I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big subject. It's hard to explain all of these things. Um, and I'll share some more videos with you from YouTube where people explain these concepts in a very nice way. Okay. Any other questions? Okay then. Um, I guess. Uh, I guess that's it then. Right. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Bye bye. Unless there are any more questions, you can ask. If not, I'll stop the recording.